This is the day of the year when racing fans everywhere feel their pulses rev faster and for the gentlemen who race to start their engines. Quédese con nosotros que ya viene Speed Week. Hi everyone, I'm Bob Jenkins and happy Memorial Day weekend. We're glad you could join us for our annual Speed Week special featuring the greatest spectacle in racing, the Indianapolis 500 and the NASCAR Winston Cup Coca-Cola 600 at Charlotte. We have complete reports from both sites and we'll look closely at who has the best chances for victory lane on Sunday. First, the running of the 79th Indianapolis 500. Drama of the highest degree pervaded during the final weekend of qualifying at Indy. And when the final gun went off at 6 p.m., even the most seasoned Indy veteran was stunned by what they had, or rather what they hadn't seen. Derek Daly watched the story unfold. Derek? It's still hard to grasp the magnitude of this story. And in fact, there's an eerie, hollow feel about garages A17 to A20 which are normally a hive of activity for the Marlboro team Penske. But incredibly, they failed to qualify a single car for two of the finest racing drivers in the world for this year's Indy 500. So what went wrong? It was evident early in the month that the 95 Penske was simply not fast enough. Roger Penske then said, we will manage our way out of this, but he has never had to manage his way off the bubble before, and this, perhaps, is where he made his biggest mistake. After waving off Fittipaldi's speed, which was fast enough to qualify on Saturday, why then did he accept a slower speed on Sunday? He had the time to put more new tires on Fittipaldi's Lola and send him through the line again. Alan Sir Jr. was simply never fast enough and never comfortable, and time ran out. The principles were devastating. You know, obviously, uh, we didn't come prepared. You know, we weren't prepared, and, and uh, you know, we got blowed off. That's life. I mean, it makes us more mature, it makes more stronger to come back. It's a new challenge for us next year. It hurts an awful lot. You know, our guys are down, there's no question about it. I've got to take the responsibility. But I, I missed on lap three when the, the valve blew off. What Indy means, you know, when I won the first year, it, it, it's hard to put into words, and, and, uh, and now it's really hard to put into words what, uh, what missing the show is about. So what are the ramifications? Well, Roger Penske has no opportunity to maybe stand here in victory circle again. Remember, he's been here already a record ten times. Commercially, they have commercial backers who will all be here on Sunday, now to be entertained by Roger personally, instead of by his racing team out in the track. Also consider this, Alan Sir Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi have no opportunity to gain valuable championship points. But make no mistake about it, because of the difficulties here of Bubble Day, Roger Penske's team, I believe, will be back bigger and better than ever. For Speed Week, I'm Derek Daly. All right, thank you, Derek. On Monday, Penske notified USAC that he had pulled Emerson Fittipaldi as the first alternate. The team spent the remainder of the week testing in Milwaukee. The 33 starters got their final two hours of practice in during Carburation Day on Thursday. The two Honda-powered cars of Scott Goodyear and Andre Ribeiro led the speed chart at 228.3 and 227.4, respectively, completing the top five, Michael Andretti, Hiro Machusta, and Paul Tracy. When asked to visualize Dwayne Sweeney's green flag, Ari Leyendyke told Speed Week that it's big, it's green, and when he drops it, you go. Goodyear may have the outside group advantage, but don't be surprised to see pole sitter Brayton leading lap one or lap 200. The Menard engines have yet to fail. Behind them sits an all-Ford second row of Michael Andretti, Jacques Villeneuve, and Mauricio Gujelmin. All three teams have had that quiet, smooth month that usually spells front-runner at the end. It's red, white, and blue for the All-American trio in row three, Robbie Gordon, Scott Pruitt, and Jimmy Vassar. Gordon is ready to settle his Indy score. Pruitt is Firestone's cornerstone. And with a fourth here last year, Vassar is more than a legitimate shot. No offense, Hero and Andre, but we got to pick Stan Fox as our dark horse favorite in row four. Not many laps of practice, but he stuck it in the field on the first day, making maximum use of time and equipment. Maybe overshadowed by the Penske saga is the fact that Roberto Guerrero's track record of 232 from 92 gets another year in the history books. And we keep hearing this voice that keeps saying, Cheever. 
Danny Sullivan moves up to row six due to Herta retreating to his backup. Sullivan is now one of only three former winners in the field. Can you believe spin and win was 10 years ago? Halfway back, finds rookie Gilles DeFerrin, sophomore Hideshi Matsuda, and Penske backup benefactor Bobby Rahal. Look for Rahal to drive the smartest race since winning here in 1986. In row eight, look for the same from Rahal teammate Boisel. The oldest rookie at age 39, first eight qualifier Salazar survived the bump, and his slowest in the field speed of 225 is up over four miles an hour from last year. In row nine, we find drivers from Mexico, Belgium, and the only Fittipaldi in this year's race. Christian was able to get over his first weekend jitters, becoming the fifth and final Brazilian in the show. Speaking of age, Lynn St. James makes her fourth race and gets the dubious honor of being the oldest driver in the field, 48 plus, come race day. 27-year-old Scott Sharp puts a second Foyt car in the field with just minutes remaining on Sunday. Next to the front row, this is the most talked about. Johansson will be remembered for his emotional run bumping Emerson Fittipaldi from the 500. Jones goes for the Indy Charlotte duel, and Herta has been cleared to drive in his backup machine. Blood thicker than water, isn't it? Um, oh yeah, that's right, Mario's not in, uh, Michael then. My hero, Little Al's not in there, so uh, uh, I guess it won't be him. Uh, Robbie Gordon. I'm really pulling for Scott Goodyear. Well, I hope like heck that Bobby Rahal wins the thing. That's why I want to win it. There's another race this weekend? I think you might see a new face uh, in Victor Lane this year. Oh, well, we all know who isn't going to win it. Scott Goodyear. Whoever finishes 500 miles first, probably. Last Saturday's Winston selected Charlotte was all Jeff Gordon. His only close call came in the third segment when Dale Earnhardt and Daryl Waltrip tried to make it three wide for the lead. Gordon wisely backed off, deciding to watch from behind. That left Gordon free and clear, and with his first ever Winston Select win, he banks $300,000 and becomes the automatic favorite to repeat in the Coca-Cola 600. There are over 40 other drivers who would like to stop Gordon in his new car named Blazer. They got their first chance Wednesday as Goody's Pole Night locked in the top 20 positions for 600 miles on Sunday. A huge crowd turned out to see 54 entrants attempt to make the 40-car starting field. Ken Schrader's Budweiser Chevrolet looked very strong early. He decided to shut it off after only one lap. His speed of 181.519 miles an hour grabbed him a temporary pole spot, but eventually was bested. Effective just prior to pole night was an aerodynamic change to the Pontiacs. The front air dam was lowered by a quarter inch and the rear spoiler was raised also a quarter inch. Michael Waltrip turned in a respectable 181.622 on his run and by evening's end would be at the top of the Pontiac class. Under some watchful eyes, Schrader's teammate Jeff Gordon took his turn and by the end of lap one, it was clear. This car is fast, period. Gordon only needed one circuit to get an event record with a time of 29.370 seconds and a speed of 183.861 miles an hour. Our Benny Parsons talked to Jeff. Thanks, Benny. Uh, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm as much in shock right now. I mean, I thought we had a car to, to get the pole, but I didn't know we had a car that was going to go that fast. And, uh, you know, there might be some guys that can beat it, but if they do, they're going to have to work real hard, and my hat's going to be off to them, trust me, if they do beat that lap. Always the biggest crowd noisemaker, five-time Charlotte winner Dale Earnhardt was next to last out, but couldn't even come close to the top 20. Back in his original colors, Dale posted a speed of only 179.045 miles an hour, good for 34th. So Gordon gets the top spot for the second consecutive 600 and will try to match the 92 and 93 back-to-back -back feet of Dale Earnhardt. Bobby Labonte gets the other front row honor. He's ready to climb from eighth in the points and better his best ever Charlotte finish of 15th. 1995 Rookie of the Year contender Ricky Craven gets his best ever Winston Cup starting position, putting his Kodiak Chevy inside of row two. Brett Bodine always runs strong at Charlotte. Junior's knack with gas mileage could be the key. Waltrip winds up fifth and is the only Pontiac in the top 20. 1993 Coca-Cola 600 pole sitter Ken Schrader is recovering well from his thumb injury, but this race will take over four hours, even at record speed. Sterling Marlin gets a row four start and his second chance at adding to his bid for the Winston Million. He's got to win here to be eligible for the Labor Day big money at Darlington. In row five, we finally get to our dark horse pick, Morgan Shepard. The Wood Brothers last won this race in 1987 with Kyle Petty. 
Sports Center favorite Dick Trickle is still looking for his first top 10 finish of the season. Off the grid 12th will be Hut Strickland making his fourth appearance in the Bernstein Ford. Terry Labonte makes it complete for the Rick Hendrick team and hopes that 13 turns out to be lucky for him. It worked for Earnhardt in 1993. And Todd Bodine is the first of three drivers with identical speeds. Last week on Speed Week, we saw Rick Mast in an unfamiliar seat at Indy. This week, he's back home, and although going slower than his Indy counterparts, 180 miles an hour is just fine with him. Chad Little takes a break from the Bush Grand National schedule and will start next to Ricky Rudd. Ricky has never tasted victory at Charlotte, and he's ready to jumpstart this season's summer stretch. Bill Elliott and Jeff Burton come in safely. Elliott will be doing the Batusi in special colors for this race and is looking for his first 600 win since 87. Stay tuned, same bat time, same bat channel. Steve Kinzer is back to his World of Outlaw winning ways. At Wednesday night's stop in Lernerville, Pennsylvania, Kinzer passed Cousin Mark with six laps to go. Nigel Mansell and McLaren have called it quits after delays and two disappointing results in Formula One. Mansell says he has no immediate plans in Formula One, and the parting with McLaren was on the best terms possible. Speed Week will be right back. Welcome back to Speed Week. One year ago this weekend, two drivers in two of America's most popular series made a huge impact on motorsports. Today, they are stars. Both are young and talented, but that's where their personal similarities ends. Jeff and Jacques, Gordon and Villeneuve, a pair as different as night and day. Last May, Toyota Atlantic graduate and son of the late Canadian Formula One star, Phil New came to Indianapolis as a rookie with Forsyth Green Racing. He started inside row two, led seven laps, finished in the runner-up position just eight seconds behind Allenzer Jr., and won the coveted Rookie of the Year honors. In short, he was very fast and very impressive. As Indy's sun was setting, the lights were being turned on 500 miles to the south in Charlotte. California-born, Hoosier short track race, now stock car favorite Jeff Gordon, got his date with destiny. In a brand new car, he won the pole for the Coca-Cola World 600, and a few hours later was tasting his first NASCAR Winston Cup victory. Once you find Victor Lane, uh, it's like, now you know how to do it. Now you know you can do it. And it, it, for the next five races after, after the Coca-Cola 600, we, we were really, really strong. And I, I do believe that that has changed me dramatically. It's taught me, you know, how to win at this level and taught me that I can win at this level. And, and I've been driving different ever since. Anyway, five years ago, I didn't really know what the Indy 500 were. Uh, was raised in Europe. Uh, it's a different mentality. And you hardly hear about the, the Indy over there anyway. And to me, racing was in Europe, was Formula One and in Europe. Um, and my point of view changed a little bit when I got in Japan. Um, and once I got there, I got really more open to, to what was happening in racing all around the world. And that's when I saw my first Indy 500 on TV. As long as I can remember, it's always been the thing I was going to do. Um, you know, when I was younger, it, 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 I didn't look at it as as uh, making a living out of it, I was just looking at it, you know, it was fun and that's what I was going to do because I was going to have fun. When you're a kid, all you do is have fun, basically. Um, but the more I got involved with it and, and the more I, I, I see the, all the professional side about it, and, and uh, I'm really happy, actually, I'm into that. I knew it was going to be my career and what I was going to be doing for a living uh, came about and probably until I, I graduated from high school. You know, I was in between whether I should go to college or whether I should continue racing and to me you know I made up my mind that if racing pans out if things start going well in racing I was going to try to stick it out with racing and the day I graduated from high school I went and ran like fourth in the World of Outlaws sprint car race I said that's a pretty good sign to me I don't think you deserve any respect uh, until you earn it I've never tried to copy anybody or to, to, to try and do okay this guy does that so we'll, we'll try and do the same it's Driving a race car is something really personal. It's something that you feel. It's not something that, that you have to decide as the way, you know, you have to turn the steering wheel and so on. So you, you basically have to learn from your own mistakes, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, I've, I've heard from him last year, uh, 
uh, with his Brickyard win and, uh, and uh, his other win before that. I have certainly watched him in Indy cars, and, and you know, I know he's impressed a lot of people. And, and every time I watch, you know, I see his name, and I'm thinking, you know, hey, who is this guy? From what I, I can gather, he's a pretty, pretty good driver. Coming up on this Speed Week special, a look back on Danny's incredible spin and win at Indy. A decade ago, one of the most incredible racing maneuvers happened during the 1985 Indianapolis 500. So we decided to gather all the major players for a little reunion. I never thought about winning the race. I never thought about, um, I just, I was driving the car and just everything was going good and I was going fast and I was moving up. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm behind Mario. Danny was stalking me pretty hard and I was, I was working fairly well at the time. In fact, I was fairly happy with the car, but uh, I just couldn't shake him. Everybody had their eyes glued on the duel between the leader of the race, Mario Andretti, and the challenger, Danny Sullivan. The crowd came to its feet, as is normal when you get, you know, a uh, pass for the lead. Sullivan darts out, pulls alongside Mario Andretti. He just took me all the way down to the grass. I think gave him a lot of room, I must be honest, but I knew that it was the apron yet. It just tripped the car just a little bit when I got in front of him. Just ever so slightly, the back just slid. I guess the crowd pointed about the same time that Tom Carnegie started yelling about a spin in turn one. And I thought, maybe I can hold it. And I didn't hold it. And then his life, his future is in the hands of the racing gods. No, he's squirrely. No, he's spinning. Daddy Sullivan spins. But he goes around twice and gathers it. And Absolutely and incredible. Just as this all happened, just in a split-second decision, I just I dove as hard as I could to the inside. And then the smoke kind of cleared, and I hadn't hit anything, and I realized I was facing the right way. And then he came screaming back at me, saying, it's me, it's me, it's me, I'm okay, or something he said. And he said that I sounded normal, except I was a couple octaves higher, you know, from doing it. I think I took advantage of the opportunity to sort of deadpan Derek and went, uh, what do you think, four tires, Derek? I was more angry. I mean, I can't repeat what I was saying to myself because I'd just gotten in the lead of the Indianapolis 500 and I'd blown it. I didn't know that he hadn't touched anything. And before you know, man, there he is again. You know, so. <laughs> 20 laps later, lap 140, the same spot on the racetrack. And you can imagine the fans out there cheering then. Mario, as I said earlier, I mean, he's tough to pass at any time. Uh, and one, I'd gotten away with it first time and to try to do it in the second spot was going to be tough this time this next time i think i gave him a little more room you know and i shouldn't have but uh, i did and you know that's a fairly big chess game at you know 200 plus miles an hour but uh you know that's what it's all about winning the indianapolis 500 cheater danny sullivan recovered from the spin he's now in the lead of the indianapolis 500 i never thought or believed I was going to win it until I came out of turn four on the last night and really was about halfway to the start finish line and I knew even if it blew up I was still going to get across the line before him. The Indianapolis 500 has a new champion as Danny Sullivan has won the 69th Indianapolis 500. Somebody was riding along with Danny that day because um, you know you just don't do those things and get away and let alone win the race so it was a special day. I, I met every person who was sitting between turns one and two, because I've signed everyone's autograph at least twice, because everybody that I've met, I was sitting right there where you spun, you know. Ten years later, he's back, he's ready, and uh, we're glad to have him here. But something like that, spin and win, I don't think it'll ever happen again. If I didn't look at Sullivan every day, I'd say it's hard to believe, but I look at how well he's aged, or how badly he's aged, and I... <laughs> I, uh, I'd have to say, yeah, it's probably at least 10 years. In some ways, it seems like it was forever ago. In some ways, it seems like it was just a couple of years back because the, the memories that are there are, are certainly very vivid. Uh, I'll take a win at Indianapolis anyway, any shape, any form. Well, Danny, we hope you get it on Sunday. Now, here's a look at the CarQuest racing calendar with events coming up. your auto parts needs, you'll find it at CarQuest. 
On Sunday, the man who will be in the 34th car at Indy is undoubtedly the envy of every race fan. In his real life, he's a powerful automotive executive. But on race day, he becomes race fan and pace car pilot. Well, I, I guess all my life. You know, I, I don't know anything about Walter Mitty, but uh, I've driven Indianapolis a, a million times in my mind as a kid, listening to it on the radio. I understand that restoring vintage Chevys is a hobby of yours. How many do you have? Well, I'm at five now, and uh, I, I was fortunate enough after 1993 to buy the one and only six-speed pace car. We built one for, uh, for uh, Muncie, and I wound up with uh, the one six-speed car, and it is a fabulous, fabulous car. Right now, it has a sum total of about 7,800 miles on it, but I have a 57 Chevy Bel Air uh, sport coupe that's just phenomenal, and a 69 RSSS Camaro that John DeLorean had and uh, Karen Valentine had, and then I got and uh, my wife just presented me on my 60th birthday with a 55 Chevy Bel Air two-door that I've been trying to buy for six years. And I was not persistent enough to buy that car. My wife bought it. She got it done. And then I've got a little project uh, that, uh, that we're working on right now that involves a 38 Chevy. So. I don't care what you've done or where you've been, when you're at the front of the field on race morning and there are 300,000 race fans all around you, it must be a real thrill. Can you put it into words? Well, first, <laughs> regardless of the last time you went, you, <laughs> you need the restroom. <laughs> For an amateur, I guarantee you. I can imagine what the, the guys behind me feel like, but it is the... Uh, you know, something that's even bigger than that, when you're out on the grid and you're ready to start and the cars are lined up and they play back home again in Indiana and they play the national anthem. Man, this thing is really, it's just too big. And, and it is, it's just, it's too big to comprehend. But the one thing that they told me the first time I was down here, you know, when you, when you, you come down to start the race, you're going to pull off and get, get in the pits. You know, pit lane, don't look up. You know, don't look up at the crowd. The crowd's not looking at you. They're looking at the field. And, and, and uh, I guarantee you, if you did that over once or twice, maybe you might get by with it once. Because the effect is so spectacular. I did it just to see what it was like. And, uh, you see, it's almost like the crowd closing in on you. It's, it's the color, it's the, everything waving, and you see the gas, you know, the fuel tanks down on the side, and all the noise behind you. And it's uh, the rush is just something that no one can describe in adequate terms. Before we leave you tonight, all of us at Speed Week would like to send our condolences to the family of North Wilkesboro Speedway President Enoch Staley. Staley, who co-founded the North Carolina track in 1947, passed away early Monday morning. He was 76. The countdown continues to Memorial Day weekend, and we leave you with the tribute to the Holman George family in celebration of 50 years of ownership in the greatest of sporting traditions. Have a safe weekend. So long, everyone.